Rule 1. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. The poor and stressed always die first, and in greater numbers. They are also much more susceptible to non-infectious diseases, such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. When the aristocracy catches a cold, as it is said, the working class dies of pneumonia. If you start to straighten up, then people will look at and treat you differently. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is to accept the terrible responsibility of life, with eyes wide open. It means deciding to voluntarily transform the chaos of potential into the realities of habitable order. It means adopting the burden of self-conscious vulnerability and accepting the end of the unconscious paradise of childhood, where finitude and mortality are only dimly comprehended. It means willingly undertaking the sacrifices necessary to generate a productive and meaningful reality. So, attend carefully to your posture. Quit drooping and hunching around. Speak your mind. Put your desires forward as if you had a right to them, at least the same right as others. Walk tall and gaze forthrightly ahead. Dare to be dangerous. Encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways desperate for its calming influence. Rule 2. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. People are better at filling and properly administering prescription medication to their pets than to themselves. In any case, that which we subjectively experience can be likened much more to a novel or a movie than to a scientific description of physical reality. It is the drama of lived experience, the unique, tragic, personal death of your father compared to the objective death listed in the hospital records, the pain of your first love, the despair of dashed hopes, the joy attendant upon a child's success. If we wish to take care of ourselves properly, we would have to respect ourselves, but we don't, because we are not least in our own eyes fallen creatures. If we lived in truth, if we spoke the truth, then we could walk with God once again, and respect ourselves, and others, and the world. Then we might treat ourselves like people we cared for. We might strive to set the world straight. We might orient it toward heaven, where we would want people we cared for to dwell, instead of hell, where our resentment and hatred would eternally sentence everyone. There are so many ways that things can fall apart, or fail to work altogether, and it is always wounded people who are holding it together. To treat yourself as if you were someone you are responsible for helping is, instead, to consider what would be truly good for you. This is not what you want. It is also not what would make you happy. You need to consider the future and think, what might my life look like if I were caring for myself properly? You could help direct the world on its careening trajectory, a bit more toward heaven and a bit more away from hell. Once having understood hell, researched it, so to speak particularly your own individual hell you could decide against going there or creating that. You could aim elsewhere. You Rule 3. Make friends with people who want the best for you. The same thing happens when well-meaning counselors place a delinquent teen among comparatively civilized peers. The delinquency spreads, not the stability. Down is a lot easier than up. Assume first that you are doing the easiest thing, and not the most difficult. Besides, if you buy the story that everything terrible just happened on its own, with no personal responsibility on the part of the victim, you deny that person all agency in the past. In this manner, you strip him or her of all power. Here's something to consider if you have a friend whose friendship you wouldn't recommend to your sister, or your father, or your son, why would you have such a friend for yourself? You should choose people who want things to be better, not worse. It's a good thing, not a selfish thing, to choose people who are good for you. It's appropriate and praiseworthy to associate with people whose lives would be improved if they saw your life improve. When you dare aspire upward, you reveal the inadequacy of the present and the promise of the future. Don't think that it is easier to surround yourself with good healthy people than with bad unhealthy people. It's not. A good, healthy person is an ideal. It requires strength and daring to stand up near such a person. Have some humility. Have some courage. Use your judgment and protect yourself from too uncritical compassion and pity. Rule 4. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who someone else is today. No matter how good you are at something or how you rank your accomplishments, there is someone out there who makes you look incompetent. 
in a million years, who's going to know the difference? The proper response to that statement is not, well, then, everything is meaningless. It, any idiot can choose a frame of time within which nothing matters. Talking yourself into irrelevance is not a profound critique of being. It's a cheap trick of the rational mind. To begin with, there is not just one game at which to succeed or fail. There are many games and, more specifically, many good games games that match your talents, involve you productively with other people, and sustain and even improve themselves across time. It's also unlikely that you're playing only one game. You have a career in friends and family members in personal projects and artistic endeavors and athletic pursuits. Pay attention. Focus on your surroundings, physical and psychological. Notice something that bothers you, that concerns you, that will not let you be, which you could fix, that you would fix. You can find such somethings by asking yourself three questions. What is it that is bothering me? Is that something I could fix? And would I actually be willing to fix it? If you find that the answer is no to any or all of the questions, then look elsewhere. Aim lower. Search until you find something that bothers you, that you could fix, that you would fix, and then fix it. That might be enough for the day. What could I do that I would do to make life a little better? Rule 5. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Was it really a good thing, for example, to so dramatically liberalize the divorce laws in the 1960s? It's not clear to me that the children whose lives were destabilized by the hypothetical freedom this attempt at liberation introduced would say so. Horror and terror lurk behind the walls provided so wisely by our ancestors. We tear them down at our peril. We skate, unconsciously, on thin ice, with deep, cold waters below, where unimaginable monsters lurk. People often get basic psychological questions backwards. Why do people take drugs? Not a mystery. It's why they don't take them all the time that's the mystery. Why do people suffer from anxiety? That's not a mystery. How is that people can ever be calm? There's the mystery. We're breakable and mortal. A million things can go wrong in a million ways. We should be terrified out of our skulls at every second. But we're not. The same can be said for depression, laziness, and criminality. Two-year-olds, statistically speaking, are the most violent of people. They kick, hit, and bite, and they steal the property of others. They do so to explore, to express outrage and frustration, and to gratify their impulsive desires. More importantly, for our purposes, they do so to discover the true limits of permissible behavior. How else are they ever going to puzzle out what is acceptable? Infants are like blind people, searching for a wall. They have to push forward and test to see where the actual boundaries lie. Kids do this frequently. Scared parents think that a crying child is always sad or hurt. This is simply not true. Anger is one of the most common reasons for crying. Careful analysis of the musculature patterns of crying children has confirmed this. Anger crying and fear or sadness crying do not look the same. They also don't sound the same and can be distinguished with careful attention. Anger crying is often an act of dominance and should be dealt with as such. How was the kid? His father asked me when he got home much later that night. Good, I said. No problem at all. He's asleep right now. Did he get up? Said his father. No, I said. He slept the whole time. Dad looked at me. He wanted to know, but he didn't ask, and I didn't tell. You can teach virtually anyone anything with such an approach. First, figure out what you want. Then, watch the people around you like a hawk. Finally, whenever you see anything a bit more like what you want, swoop in and deliver a reward. Your daughter has been very reserved since she became a teenager. You wish she would talk more. That's the target, more communicative daughter. One morning, over breakfast, she shares an anecdote about school. That's an excellent time to pay attention. That's the reward. Stop texting and listen. Unless you don't want her to tell you anything ever again. Skinner, however, was a realist. He noted that use of reward was very difficult. The observer had to attend patiently until the target spontaneously manifested the desired behavior and then reinforce. This required a lot of time and a lot of waiting, and that's a problem. However, children would not have such a lengthy period of natural development prior to maturity if their behavior did not have to be shaped. Given this, the fundamental moral question is not how to shelter children completely from misadventure and failure, so they never experience any fear or pain. 
but how to maximize their learning so that useful knowledge may be gained with minimal cost. If a child has not been taught to behave properly by the age of four, it will forever be difficult for him or her to make friends. The research literature is quite clear on this. So now we have two general principles of discipline. The first, limit the rules. The second, use the least force necessary to enforce those rules. So here are a few practical hints. Timeout can be an extremely effective form of punishment, particularly if the misbehaving child is welcome as soon as he controls his temper. An angry child should sit by himself until he calms down. Then he should be allowed to return to normal life. That means the child wins instead of his anger. If your child is the kind of determined varmint who simply runs away, laughing, when placed on the steps or in his room, physical restraint might have to be added to the timeout routine. A child can be held carefully but firmly by the upper arms until he or she stops squirming and pays attention. Here's a fourth principle, one that is more particularly psychological. Parents should understand their own capacity to be harsh, vengeful, arrogant, resentful, angry, and deceitful. People are aggressive and selfish, as well as kind and thoughtful. For this reason, no adult human being, no hierarchical, predatory ape, can truly tolerate being dominated by an upstart child. Revenge will come. Ten minutes after a pair of all-too-nice and patient parents have failed to prevent a public tantrum at the local supermarket, they will pay their toddler back with the cold shoulder when he runs up, excited, to show mom and dad his newest accomplishment. Here's a fifth and final and most general principle. Parents have a duty to act as proxies for the real world, merciful proxies, caring proxies, but proxies nonetheless. This obligation supersedes any responsibility to ensure happiness, foster creativity, or boost self-esteem. It is the primary duty of parents to make their children socially desirable. Rule 6. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Many, perhaps even most, of the adults who abuse children were abused themselves as children. However, the majority of people who are abused as children do not abuse their own children. But success makes us complacent. We forget to pay attention. We take what we have for granted. We turn a blind eye. We fail to notice that things are changing or that corruption is taking root. And everything falls apart. Is that the fault of reality of God? Or do things fall apart because we have not paid sufficient attention? Have you cleaned up your life? If the answer is no, here's something to try. Start to stop doing what you know to be wrong. Start stopping today. Don't waste time questioning how you know that what you're doing is wrong, if you are certain that it is. Don't reorganize the state until you have ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try to rule a city?